we have Audrey Harrison, who's a re research biologist uh, with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Development Center in Vicksburg, uh, where she focuses on aquatic insects. Audrey's been an avid uh, entomologist since childhood, a regular attendee of, uh, since childhood she was a regular attendee of the Mississippi State University's entomology camp. And during her undergraduate program in biology at Mississippi College, Audrey had the opportunity to work, uh, to do research with Dr. Bill Stark, which set her on a trajectory she's on today. Since then, Audrey has completed a master's in entomology at Clemson University and just completed her PhD in biology at the University of Mississippi. So please help me welcome Audrey Harrison. I'm so glad that you all came. I really didn't know what to expect because I'm always in Vicksburg on the first Tuesday of the month um, at noon. And so I've never actually gotten to come to one of the noon lectures. So I'm really thankful to be here today and glad to have the opportunity to present something that I'm not an expert in but I'm very passionate about. Um, I would like to preface this talk by saying that I'm not a lepidopterist and I'm not a botanist. So I'm an amateur but I care a whole lot and sometimes that um, can be just as good um, whenever you're trying to work in the field of conservation. So I'm an aquatic entomologist. I study mostly stream and river insects. Um, my favorite insects are stoneflies, and so this is a little bit out of my comfort zone, but over the last few years I've been trying to uh, promote monarch conservation, and um, I've done some work with trying to get the Department of Transportation to modify their mowing schedules um, to avoid mowing during, migra during monarch migrations, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. but. I'm going to try to keep this upbeat, and um, and if you have any questions, I'll, I plan to have time at the end to take your questions. So let's get started. So just a little bit of background on the monarch butterfly. They are in the family Nymphalidae, which are the brush-footed butterflies, and they're in, a sub, in the subfamily Danaeinae, which are the milkweed butterflies. They are worldwide in distribution. Um, they are most common in North America, but there are several other small populations across, the, across um, Europe and um, in New Zealand and Australia, although it's a little bit, um, it's still unknown where they originated and how they got across the world. Um, and they're iconic here due to their long migration across North America. And that migration happens twice a year, in the spring and in the fall. And you can see that Mississippi is an important place for in, within that monarch migration. Um, we see monarchs twice a year, in the spring and in the fall. We are a spring, we're in the spring breeding area, which is this orange color. And so when monarchs are coming from their overwintering sites, in the mountains of Mexico, they come across the Gulf of Mexico, up through Texas, and, um, and they breed in Mississippi. And then their, their children continue north and, um, and travel up into southern Canada. And, um, and then we also see monarchs again in the fall when they are returning to their overwintering grounds in Mexico. And that, there's a little bit of um, discussion about whether we are a breeding um, population then or whether we were historically or if we are most important as a nectar source during the fall migration. Um, historically, some researchers think that Mississippi would have been important for nectaring monarchs, but we wouldn't necessarily have had milkweed plants that were fresh enough to raise caterpillars and the caterpillars go to Mexico. But monarchs that we have tagged in Clinton, in Clinton in the fall have been found in Mexico. So now, um, whether or not that is due to human activity or not, we are a breeding, we, we do serve as a breeding ground for the fall migration of monarchs. In fact, I've had, I have monarchs on my milkweed plants right now and have for the last couple of weeks. So if you have milkweed growing at home, check them because you should start to see monarchs soon if you haven't already. 
This is a, gra uh, a map of the 2018 spring migration. And I really love these maps that, um, that are on the Journey North website. There, some of you probably report your sightings of monarchs to Journey North. They um, are an organization that tracks um, migratory animals, all different types of animals that migrate. And I usually try to report my first sighting of monarchs every year in the spring and in the fall. And you can see that, um, that we show up Monarchs show up in Mississippi within the first um, within the first part of, of March in southern Mississippi on in the end of March, and I usually see them in in northwestern Hines County toward the end of March. So keep that in mind as you are growing your plants and looking for native milkweeds around your yard or around your property is that you want to start looking for monarchs at the end of March, beginning of April, and you want to make sure that you have milkweed available during that time frame because for sure we are part of that spring migration. Um, one of the sad things about monarchs, and I'm going to try not to focus on it too much, but I can't not mention it, is that they are in decline. Um, and have been for, for a while now, uh, for at least a decade, decade and a half. Um, this is, these are current data provided by Journey North and, and they work with scientists who, um, who do butterfly counts while the monarchs are all huddled together overwintering in Mexico and they have tracked this for since um, the early 90s and in that time frame monarchs have declined pretty drastically. This year was no exception. The, the number of monarchs that made it to their overwintering grounds in Mexico was lower this year than, than in the last several years. And, um, and so when you are asking about the causes of those declines, I just read a paper that was just published um, in Science that talked about how complex the problem really is. And it really is all because of humans. We it is habitat destruction or alteration. Um, it's planting of, of genetically modified crops and then therefore being able to spray herbicide in broad applications. Um, it's pesticide use, climate change, um, different, different extreme weather events can take a big toll and, ha and, and it has taken a big toll on migrating populations. Um, or, you know, extreme weather events, a late frost can, can be devastating to overwintering monarchs as they're getting ready to fly back north. Um, and then in Mexico, something that is completely out of our control, it, there's been a lot of logging of their overwintering sites, and they're very specific about the trees, the fir trees that they will overwinter on. And, and so, you know, some areas are protected, but you can't protect everything. And um, one thing that's not in this little figure is that disease has become more, um, common in monarchs, especially caterpillars. And I've had several people contact me recently about their caterpillars just dying and they've had, you know, a lot of mortality on their captive reared caterpillars. And there are a lot of different causes of that. And, um, and one of them is um, a protozoan parasite that um, can, um, that is common on tropical milkweed. And if you're feeding tropical milkweed to your caterpillars, um, that, that seems to be um, impacting the survival rates of the caterpillars themselves. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the life cycle of the monarch butterfly, I wanted to include this graphic. Um, they really depend on milkweed for each stage of their life in one way or another. The adult butterflies use milkweed as a nectar source, and then they also <laughs> seek out milkweed to lay their eggs or to oviposit on. So here you can see this is what the eggs look like if you're searching your milkweed plants. It's a, a small creamy white colored egg, and this is a hatchling. It, um, it, really, you just see the dark head. They, and this is what they look like right after they come out of the egg. They eat their eggshell and they continue to eat the milkweed plant until they are a full-sized caterpillar. After they have reached their maturity, they pupate into this beautiful green chrysalis that has small gold specks on it. And about two weeks later, they emerge 
into their adult butterfly form. And, um, and so this, we get to see this twice a year, which is, we're so fortunate that we live in an area that we get to observe this. It, can hap it happens all around you, whether, whether or not you know about it. And milkweed is really important. These, these butterflies um, have co-evolved, just like other insects have with, um, with milkweed plants. And um, there are really tight associations between insects and plants in their evolution. And they are, um, monarchs are dependent on milkweed for the, for the food for their caterpillars. In Mississippi, we have around 18 species of milkweed. Um, a lot of people only think that we have one or think that maybe we don't have any, but we do. We have a lot of different milkweed diversity here. And, um, and they support, our milkweed plants support other insects as well. On these milkweed plants, this is on the side of Highway 22 where I live, and um, there is a, there's a bug, a true bug called a milkweed bug that um, feeds on milkweed and milkweed seed pods and their, their babies use milkweed. Um, there are some aphids that are, that are associated with milkweed, and then there are some other caterpillars as well that you can sometimes find associated with milkweed. So it's not just monarchs, it's other things as well. And then a lot of other insects, a lot of other pollinators are attracted to the beautiful flowers of milkweed as a nectar source. So I encourage you to plant these in your yard, and we're going to talk about that more. Um, they are easy to care for. You don't have to water them. They are prairie plants, um, and they just don't require anything, really. All you have to do is plant them. You don't water them. You don't fertilize them. And you get the benefit of beautiful flowers, and you're supporting this native wildlife. So this is green antelope horn milkweed. This is our most common species of milkweed in our area. Um, this can be found up and down um, all of the major roadways in Mississippi. There are really, really large concentrations of it in Hines and Madison counties. Um, and I travel those, those roads most often, so I see, I, I notice them more there. Um, you can find them in pastures, anywhere that, um, that is maintained in kind of an early vegetative state, you can find these milkweed plants. Um, here are some of the other milkweeds that are native to Mississippi. I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but you can see that there's a lot of beauty in our milkweeds. Um, there are all different colors, sizes, shapes, and different milkweed species grow in different types of habitat. So if you don't necessarily, if you only have a shady spot, then you want to plant milkweeds that, that grow best in shady areas. If you have um, if you have a wetland, then you want to plant aquatic milkweed that grows better in wet soils. Um, and I just, I tell people, no matter what type of area that you have to plant, there's a milkweed for you. And just choose those plants based on the habitat type that you have. If you live in a pine forest, well, there are milkweeds that thrive in pine forests. And, um, and so I get a lot of my information about native plants um, on the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center website. So if you don't use that, that's a really, really great resource. It um, has all kinds of information about native plants from every state. You can search native plants. They have picture galleries. You can submit photos. Lots of good information about, about native wildflowers and native trees um, on that website. And it's wildflower.org, I'm pretty sure. So. Visit that if you have questions about maybe what to plant or where, if you need help identifying a native plant. And when I say native, I'm, does everyone know what I mean? I'm talking about a plant that is, was here, is supposed to be here before humans, a plant that naturally occurs in this area. Native plants are adapted to our climate, They're, and that's why you don't, they require very little care. Um, they, they can be used as in ornamental plantings, but they are sourced from this geographic area. So that's what I mean when I'm <coughs> saying native plants. One of the most commonly asked questions that, that I get is where I want to plant natives. I want to plant native milkweeds. I want to plant other native wildflowers but I can't find them anywhere. I can't find seeds. I can't find plants. 
Who sells them? Well, um, I mentioned this on the radio if you were listening the other day on Creature Comforts, um, but every year there are several native plant sales across our state. And these are the three that I know about. Um, Strawberry Plains Audubon Center has native plant sales if you're from North Mississippi. The Clinton Community Nature Center in Clinton has a spring and fall native plant sale. I've bought lots and lots of plants from them. And then even if, the, and if they don't sell all of their plants at the native plant sale, they still have those for sale in, in their greenhouse area year round. So, you know, it may be that you couldn't go to that, but you can check back and purchase <coughs> plants at a later time. And then the Crosby Arboretum down in Picayune also has a native plant sale. And, um, and they have, the Crosby Arboretum has been doing a lot of work trying to propagate and promote some of the other native plant, native milkweed species other than the few that are commonly available. So they've been collecting seeds. Dr. Pat Drackett, um, if you've heard that name before, she has been trying to source seeds from all across the state of Mississippi from different regions. And then she's been working with a I think it's a USDA lab that is in Pearl River, and they've been trying to grow native milkweeds in bulk. And hopefully those will be available for sale at some point. Um, and so, and I've also had success from a couple of different seed companies. I'm not trying to promote these, I'm just saying that these, these are ones that I've used, and they have, they have been good seeds. Um, native Nurseries is in West Point, Mississippi, and they have a lot of different seeds and plants and trees and everything that are native to Missi native species to Mississippi. They sort, I'm pretty sure they source their seeds from Kentucky, um, from roundstone seeds. Uh, but if you're looking for commercially available seeds, that is one source. Um, also, I have had good luck planting plants and seeds available through the Missouri Native Wildflower Nursery. Again, they source all of their seeds from Missouri, so they're not, they're not Mississippi seeds um, with Mississippi genotypes, um, but they are species that are native to our area and, in my opinion, are better choices than other ornamental plants that you can buy at a big box store to plant in your yard. And they provide the ecosystem service of being food for caterpillars and being um, native plants for native species of animals and, and other and insects and everything else. Um, my favorite thing to do now and what I'm trying to promote now is to find seeds or plants from your county. These are gonna be um, the best thing for you to plant wherever you live is to find plants that occur in your specific region. And, and I'm trying to do that more and more myself. I carry a shovel and some snippers in my car. I, I'm sure several of you do as well. I carry plastic sacks to, and just this weekend, I was in North Mississippi where the ironweed and compass plants are just outstanding. And I just had to stop and dig some up for my sister who lives in North Mississippi and plant those in her yard because they were everywhere in a power line right of way and you never know when those areas are gonna be sprayed or mowed. So I didn't take that many, but I did take a few, and hopefully they have reached a safe place where they can thrive. And, um, and so, you know, milkweeds, if you don't know this, have seed pods in which their seeds can be found. So after the flowers are pollinated um, and the flowers will, will die back, but then a seed pod will grow. And when that seed pod gets mature, it will open up, and the seeds are actually wind dispersed they're covered in this fluffy white material, and, um, and that's how they spread naturally. And so if you can find a seed pod that is mature but hasn't opened up all the way yet, that's what, that's what you really wanna find because then the seeds are really easy to harvest. And I'll talk a little bit more about propagating your seeds in just a second. So find, find milkweed, find other plants in your area, and chances are those are gonna do the best in your flower beds, in your yard, and um, are gonna have the highest chances of survival with the lowest maintenance. I don't have a green thumb at all. I can only grow native plants, but I can grow native plants pretty well <laughs> because they're really easy. And so another resource that I have found, 
and I have, I feel like this is completely underutilized, and I wish that our state botanist, Heather Sullivan, was here at this talk today. She works here. She's a great resource, Heather Sullivan. She is just a fantastic source of information, if you don't know her. She knows every plant species that grows in this state and is out sampling all the time, and she maintains the herbarium for the museum. And there are several other herbaria across our state and across the southeast. And in recent years, herbaria, unlike other, some other scientific collections, have done a fantastic job of making their data available in, online to anybody who wants to use it. And in particular, herbaria have done a, a really good job because they have digital records of all of their specimens. You can go on there and you can see pictures, hot resolution images of all of the plant specimens in this collection here. You don't even have to visit the collection. You should visit the collection, but you don't have to. It's all available, and this is where you can find it. And so I'll show you how I've been using this database and this resource and how you can use it as well. Um, so it's CERNEC is the acronym. It stands for Southeast Regional Network of Expertise and Collections. And the plant people have done a great job at securing funding from the National Science Foundation to do all of this. I worked in an herbarium during my PhD program at Ole Miss. I worked in the Pullen Herbarium. And I was, I was doing this thing. I was entering things onto, onto here. I was taking pictures of the specimens and getting it all in digital format and ready to go. And this is just an awesome, awesome resource. And this is how I use this, this resource. If I am thinking, okay, I really, really would like this beautiful milkweed species in my yard. Isn't this stunning? This is clasping milkweed. Um, this is a species that my mom found in, in just on some back roads. She was looking for rocks to put around her flower bed. But she found these plants, and I had never seen them before, and they were just absolutely beautiful. And so I was wondering, I wonder if there is anywhere nearby that I could find this milkweed species because it's gorgeous. I'm sure the monarch butterflies love it. Look at those big leaves. Those could support lots of monarch caterpillars. I want that in my yard. Where can I find it? So I get on this CERNEC website and I look for this species, Asclepius and Plexicollis, on this database. And voila, here are thousands of records that show up. And they, some of, most of them have GPS coordinates. They have descriptions about where they were found. And if I wanted to go look for a seed pod, I might just, these are perennials, I might just go to one of those areas and look around and see if they're still there. And and then you can even, if you want to see if, if that's, if you want to check your identification, you can look at pictures of the actual specimen. Um, you can see that the, the leaves of the clasping milkweed clasp around the stem. Well, that, that's exactly what I had here. And so you can use this in a variety of different ways. Um, if I wanted to look on a map and look at where all this species occurs, what is its distribution in Mississippi, I might search for Asclepius tuberosa or butterfly weed, this stunningly beautiful orange butterfly weed that is in bloom right now all over. I've seen it on the red sides. This is a plant that I marked on Highway 22 a couple of years ago. It bloomed again this year. I was trying to get them to not mow it down um, because I really wanted some Hines County seeds from it. And so I, I did a search and, and just to see where in Mississippi this has been put into any of the regional herbaria. And it outputs a map. And you can click on any one of those data points and you can find, okay, well, if I'm in Clinton, I might want to go down Spring Ridge Road and look around the roadsides and see if, if I'm there at the right time. I can get seed, a seed pod from that. And I can try to propagate some native seeds. So um, this is just an incredible resource. Use it. This is what it's here for. A lot of, lot of work has gone into these scientific collections of all different types of things, plants, insects, birds, fish, and this is the place that holds a lot of those for our state. And so we need to support those collections and utilize them because they really are an invaluable resource. So, another question that I get very often is how do you grow milkweed from seeds? It's a lot cheaper to purchase milkweed seeds than it is milkweed plants. Um, and if you are harvesting your own milkweed seeds, you can get a lot of plants from one single seed pod. 
here's what I do. I don't know that this is anything technical, but it works for me and it's worked, it's worked for several different milkweed species that I've tried to plant from seed. I take a Ziploc bag and a paper towel and I spread out the paper towel. I put it, the contents of a seed pod or a seed pack on that paper towel. I fold it up, wet it with distilled water, put it in the Ziploc bag and close it. Put the Ziploc bag in the refrigerator for about three weeks. Milkweed seeds need to be cold stratified. In nature, they go through winter. They get wet, they get rained on, they get covered up with wet leaves. They, get, they just go through all of the natural patterns that, of weather that happen outside. So we need to mimic that. And then after about three weeks, I'll take that bag out of the refrigerator and I put it in a sunny spot. I just put it on my kitchen table next to a window. And in about three to four days, I start checking every day for seeds that have germinated. And when, they, when you see that they have started to sprout, you can just pick them up with forceps or with the tweezers and plant them. I, I have the best luck when I mix half potting soil with half sand. They, the species that I've grown do really well in well-drained soils. And, and then I just mist them and keep them watered until they're, you know, a few inches high and then I'll plant them wherever I want them to go. And the ones that aren't, so every day when I check the seeds that have not yet germinated, I put those back in the refrigerator, leave them, leave them for a couple of days, take them back out. And then if you've done it for about a week, put them back in there, leave them in there for a couple of more weeks, then try it again. Um, so that's how I've had good luck with milkweed. I know that there are different methods that, that other people have tried, but this is what's worked for me. It's very easy to do and it's kind of self-contained. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about some other plants and some other pollinators and why planting native plants um, are, are beneficial. We've talked a lot about monarchs and a lot about milkweeds, but there are a ton, we have so much plant diversity, y'all, and insect diversity and bird diversity. We are just a hot spot for biodiversity. And other things are important as well. Why are pollinators important? Well, you know, the answer that you always see is food. You know, our food sources. If all the bees die, then we're not gonna have any food. Well, that is important and bees are important and they do pollinate lots of our crops but pollinators are responsible for about 90 percent of the fertilization that occurs in plants and so plants depend on pollinators to spread their genes um, and that's important for the maintenance of genetic diversity in plants um, and it's important for us to have clean air water, fiber, etc., because plants serve a multitude of environmental services for us. And, and then also the pollinators themselves use those plants as a nectar source, as an energy source um, for, for themselves and their offspring. Here you can see a beautiful hummingbird. Pollinators are not just insects. Birds are pollinators. Lots of things are pollinators. Some mammals are pollinators. Um, anything that is, that is Spreading the genetic diversity of plants, um, I th I'm pretty sure it's considered a pollinator of some sort. They're taking that pollen and putting it somewhere else where it can fertilize a plant. So what can we do? Well, one thing that I've been on a crusade for is to stop accepting this. To me, this is so ugly for Mississippi. It's, it's hideous. <laughs> These areas, and now a lot of the roadsides, you have green down here, and then you just have death right here, and it is just ugly. It's an eyesore. Mississippi is much better than that, and we should stop accepting chemicals and mowing on a year-round schedule because we have so much beauty that we need to start highlighting that beauty, and one of the best ways to do that in my opinion, is for people who drive across our state should be able to share in that beauty. And um, this is a really sad thing for me because I had marked these compass plants because I wanted these seeds, and this is the road I live on, on Highway 22, and I had flagged a lot of these plants, and those mowers, that's them in the background, they just mowed right over them. And I was, we talked, and <laughs> they... <laughs> They agreed to leave everything else alone if it had an orange flag around it. I mean, it, it's 
it's a, a hot, sweaty job being out there getting chiggers and marking off plants, and I've done a lot of that. I've even done that with a baby strapped to, to myself. And, and so I was very disappointed, and to this day, I've still not gotten the seeds for this plant, and it's in bloom right now, and I'm crossing my fingers that there will be some left for me to get seed heads from. It's really easy to grow. Silphium is the genus. It's a compass plant or a um, um, rosin weed is a, another common name for it. Beautiful, gorgeous plant. And, um, and so I'm holding out for this this year. And we can start to see the value, the ecological value, and also the, be the beauty, the aesthetic beauty of this. Um, some of these pictures I just got online. Some of them people have sent me. But we have so many beautiful plants, and our roadways can be beautiful at any time of the year if we just let them. And then something that hits closer to home is how we manage our own landscapes, because this is something that you have complete control over um, for the most part, whether you rent or own, really. Most, most places give you the freedom to do at least some of your own yard work. Um, and I know that, you, that people who, who are in homeowners associations don't necessarily have all of that freedom, but you can still put natives in particular spaces as long as you keep them, you know, well kept. But we can change how we see the beauty of our own home landscaping. This is the yard of the month. Where I got this on Google, but this is just, in my opinion, this, this is lacking. It's just lacking, and I don't see how it won. I mean, I'm not, and we see this all the time. We see, I mean, look at that. And I know this is winter, but still, you can have something better than that. This, to me, look at all of those colors. Look at all of that beauty. This is a beautiful yard, and so is this. Look at all those pretty cone flowers, black-eyed Susans, gorgeous. Look, this, this person doesn't even have grass. This is my kind of yard work <laughs> where you just have that and that's just it. You don't, you don't mow. In fact, this is, this is from my yard this year. It's really pretty. I, will, I go around every evening after I put my daughter Eleanor down to bed and I look for caterpillars, I look at all the plants, I take pictures, and I was just really surprised because like I mentioned earlier, I do not have a green thumb. But I do, I do like plants, and I appreciate beauty, and I want my yard to not only service as my yard, but be part of the ecosystem. And the thing about it is, is that we don't have to sacrifice beauty for an ecological benefit. Does every, everybody knows what this is, right? Passion flower. This is the caterpillar of the Gulf fritillary butterfly. This is so. So these caterpillars depend on this plant species as a food source. And so you can have both. You can have caterpillars and you can have flowers. Now, that sometimes they will, if, if you get a, a lot of them, you will not have very much vegetation, but I say so be it. You caterpillars, you, ha you just, just have it. But this year, I haven't had as many caterpillars yet, and I have so many passion flower blooms. It's, and that, I mean, that's a stunningly beautiful plant. And I think that, Another thing that we need to change is, is what we appreciate. We need to notice and appreciate what's common. Golden rods are completely underappreciated. Um, people, I mean, I have family members who hate golden rod for no reason. They think they're allergic to it. They just think it's weedy. It is gorgeous, and it is just starting to bloom. And we get, I, I get so excited because the golden rods, when the golden rods start to bloom, that's when I know that the monarchs are coming. It is one of the most important fall nectar sources for monarch butterflies. It's one of our most common species of wildflowers here in Mississippi, and, and they absolutely love it. So we need to notice and, and have a little bit more appreciation about the things, even the things that are common. So I wanted to finish up with some suggestions on what to plant plant when, and I have some, well, never mind, they're all gone, but I had some handouts. If you didn't get a handout and you want a handout, you can email me. I'll give you my email address at the end, and I can give you some more suggestions, but th these are just, just a handful of plants that I've had really good luck with and don't require any maintenance, and they're really pretty. Um, what I try to do in my own yard is to 
try to choose plants that bloom at different times of year and that are different colors. I think that that is, that is the best way to make sure that you're providing nectar and also it's beautiful and you're attracting the widest variety of pollinators at any time of the year. So I try to make sure that I have something in bloom throughout the growing season. So in the spring, uh, flocks are beautiful. These are blue stars. This is an Amsonia species. I, I got these from Redwood. Um, I don't know I don't know where the people in Redwood got them, but if they're a native and um, and they're absolutely beautiful. They need to be divided. If anybody wants some some blue some blue stars, let me know. Um, Spigelia, the um, it, Indian pinks. I think Indian pinks, gorgeous, and they just spread like crazy. I mean, they're just and they're hummingbirds love these, and um, of course our state wildflower are Coreopsis, and Coreopsis have basically taken over my whole flower bed. I need to really do some dividing, but they, I still have Coreopsis in bloom. They have bloomed, they have not stopped blooming. Um, and then I feel like these spider warts are really underappreciated. These are some, these are the easiest thing there. When you find them, you have found them, and you are not going to harm their populations by taking a few plants. And you're going to need to divide them and share them. And that's one of the most fun things is once you start collecting these, it's kind of like collecting like baseball cards or Pokemon cards. <laughs> is that you just, oh, I want that. I don't have that species. I want that. So it becomes kind of like a fun like treasure hunt almost. And so share them with your friends and, and trade. You know, if somebody else has a native species that you don't have, well, share it with them the next year. In the summer, I've had really good luck with, um, with some bee balms, Monarda. Um, I've had good luck with the milkweeds. This is the butterfly weed that I talked about earlier, Asclepias tuberosa. This is obedient plant. Dr. Stark and I dug up a few of these plants in Simpson County, and this was their, uh, we did that two years ago, and this was their first year to bloom, but they were, I think this is actually when we were digging them up. Um, but, but they bloomed in my flower bed this year, and they're so pretty. And now they, and I collected the seeds from them and said that I can spread them elsewhere this year, and there were seeds all along this stalk. And then this is one of my newest favorite plants. This is a clasping coneflower. And it is so easy to grow from seed. I literally just sprinkled some seeds. I got these from Redwood as well, uh, north of Vicksburg. I used to live there. It's a little pocket prairie species, and they are just beautiful. Clasping coneflowers. Their, their leaves clasp around the stem as well, if that helps you remember them. In fall, helianthus, joe pie weed. Um, ironweed is what I mentioned earlier. This is just now starting to bloom here. It's already blooming in North Mississippi. Just a very vibrant, beautiful purple color. And um, the compass plant I talked about, bone set, a pretty white, very important pollinator plant. So, so t pay attention to what's blooming on the red sides and stop and stop and dig a little bit up. And if you see some, some good plants, get you a little bit, snip them at the base and plant them in your yard and you'll have them next year. And if you plant it, they will come. <laughs> These are, these are in my yard on my swamp milkweed, Asclepias incarnata. I've had really good luck with that plant, growing it from seed, and it has had monarchs all over it for the last few weeks and still does. And I've even had some emerge, and now they're using it as a nectar source. Hopefully, they're headed south now. So with that, I'll take any questions. And there's my email address. Feel free to email me. Well, you know, I don't know that for sure. Do we have any people who, are, who know that law in this room? Do you know that law, Nicole? <laughs> Nicole knows. Okay, well, I think that, the, in my opinion, the right of way is public land. And is it? It's not? Uh, what about just the sides of the road? It's same thing. Same thing? Okay. Well, if you know the landowner, then you can stop. But they, I'm telling you, I've been burned too many times. If you want something and you don't get it, it could, it could not be there the next time you drive on that roadway. Because they mow, 
and they spray. My road just got sprayed. I have no mow, no spray on, so they don't get, and if you're driving past my house and you see something you want, just get it. Um, <laughs> so as a landowner, I give you permission. Um, go ahead. I do know that you cannot dig up plants off of the Natchez Creek Parkway. Right, that is a parkway yeah. that you can't, you can't even like move it. Well, right. you can't, right. You're not even supposed to like touch like animals and things on the, although Dr. Mann does. Um, <laughs> They, they are very sensitive to pesticides. Most caterpillars are. Um, and so if you have, okay, so here's how I feel about spraying for mosquitoes. I see those trucks that come through and spray, fog the roadways, and that does probably kill every single mosquito that is right there during that time. But then what happens, you know, 10 minutes later, new mosquitoes are coming in that same area. I do, I, we don't spray anything. I mean, we spray ourselves if we're gonna be out, but, um, but we don't do any kind of, of spraying. So I would try to limit spraying, limit mowing as much as you can if you're trying to encourage. Oh, it's your neighbors? I just, as an entomologist, especially uh, mosquitoes are aquatic insects, I just don't think that works. Um, I see them come through all the time, I and because of our bee population declining, they have been asked not to spray until after it gets dark. It's not done. <laughs> well, the, we have, we, luckily we do have a voice, and, and so I would raise those concerns, especially if it's a public entity that is doing that spraying, I would voice your concern. I've hounded the Department of Transportation and really, um, they've done a really, they've done a better job this year and they, especially in North Mississippi, they've done swath mowing along the roadsides and it's been, it's been so much better. And, um, and so it does, the more that you push them, the, they do listen. It sometimes takes a lot of time and it feels like an uphill battle, but they do, they do sometimes listen and they do sometimes do what you want. Um, another thing is, if they're doing something right, also call in for that. Because if we can encourage them to say, oh, the roadsides were beautiful this year because they weren't mowed, call them and let them know that. You have an elected official that, that represents you and they can, that can really help. Dr. Mann? I've got a lot of nice things to say about Clinton, but if you tell them to not spray your yard, they will turn the spray truck off at your yard. Oh, that's good to know. And so you can contact, if the city spray your yard, well. contact the city. Looking at your chart here, is golden rod a milkweed? It's not, but it's such an important nectar plant. Okay. A nectar source. So when these, when the monarchs are migrating s south in the fall, goldenrod is the most commonly flowering plant, and a lot of times they are just stopping just to feed. They're not reproducing, and and they need something to feed on. And it and they are migrating through at a time where most of most everything else has finished blooming and has gone to seed. And so goldenrods are especially import, important for that. Goldenrods, ironweed, and boneset are the ones that I think. That's, that's what we should really be promoting in the fall. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention another source for the milkweed, the uh, Metro Master Gardeners plant sale that is held at Manel Gardens in late April each year. Okay, they sell great. milkweed. That's wonderful. <laughs> that's great. Thank you for sharing that. I wasn't aware of that. One second. Let me get... No, it doesn't. In fact, in the spring, usually the plants are only about this tall at the end of March whenever, the, whenever they start to find them. Um, they are able to detect them from really far up in, up high in the sky. They can, they can see them and they find them. Some species you can. And um, 
I have, if you email me, I can put you into contact with somebody um, who has had a lot of luck with rooting milkweed and he can explain how he does that. I've never tried it, but I've heard that you can. This is probably a really dumb question. But this has there are no dumb questions. The, the life cycle of the monarch. Now, the monarchs have come up from Mexico. After they lay their eggs, do they die? Yes. And so it's the second generation. Right. There are four generations, and and or, and then sometimes five. But it's there. It's each successive generation moves northward and moves southward, and so that's what makes it so complex because we're not only being the caretakers of the monarchs while they're here, but they are depending on other other milkweed and other places to have areas to um, to live in and reproduce in at other parts of their. The year. Basically, they live for a year. They well, one true. cycle back to Mexico, and that's it. They live less less than a year. Um, so the average lifespan of a single monarch, except for the overwintering populations, is about six to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. They are. It's generation by generation by generation. The ones that overwinter in Mexico live. They have an extended life cycle, which is why they need all that fuel that we can give them in the form of nectar. And they, they live throughout the winter. They huddle on these fir trees in, in the transvolcanic mountains of Mexico. And, and then they reproduce and move north. So it's generation by generation by generation. So do we get the first generation? In we, are, we are their first stop. Then when they come back, it's like the third generation mm -hmm. to us, and mm -hmm. then the fourth makes it back. Exactly. Gotcha. I'm so, you had a question. Are you familiar with blue vine milkweed? Blue vine milkweed? I don't have that, but I would love to see it. <laughs> <laughs> My question was, is it a true milkweed? I'm not sure. Do you know? It has the pods. It's is it an Asclepius? Dear, I don't know. You don't know? It was identified as blue vine milkweed. It's attracting wild vine does have the characteristic pods. Okay. There so are some vine, there are some vining milkweeds. Good. That's a good clue. Yes, and I wish that Heather Sullivan was here because she could definitely answer that. I was, I was just going to know if it was on Well, it could be. I'll have to look into that. When do they come back through? In the spring or in the fall? In the fall. In the fall, they are coming through right now. Right now, I've seen adults. Um, no, they'll be. We, I usually start to see them um, at the end of July. Saw them a little bit early this year, and we will continue to have them until October. So we have. They are moving through. Do you have the date that you cut your milkweed down at? That's a great question. So I usually mow everything at the end of the growing season because you want to you want to keep things in a in a like an early successional type habitat. You don't want a lot of woody growth to happen. So I cut everything at the end of the fall, usually after the first frost, and then I leave it alone so that it has a chance to grow up and be there for the caterpillars in the spring. If you if you want to host fall caterpillars, it's usually a good idea to do a midsummer mow after the migration, but before the other migration. So if you want to do a midsummer mow, you can mow your milkweed at, in June and July, and it'll have enough time usually to come back up and be there for, and be fresh for the caterpillars in the fall. Um, I, I, have, I did not mow mine this year, midsummer. It, they just seem to be coming to the different species of milkweeds that I have. They, my swamp milkweed is in bloom right now, and it still has a lot of fresh vegetation on it. And so they, that's just, it, it didn't bloom until, until now. I just want to mention that the question about the mosquito foggers, my neighbor did that too. And I asked the, the guy doing it, and hey, what is that stuff that you're spraying on everywhere? He said it was Talstar, T-A-L-S-T-A-R. When I looked it up, Wikipedia, it says it's non-selective. It kills everything. That's, that's the term, non-selective. So yeah, it kills butterflies, bees, yeah. everything. 
But you might want to try showing that in Wikipedia or something like that to your neighbor. And maybe that might help bring them around. You know what Felder said? Felder said if you're outside and worried about mosquitoes, he said get a big fan. He said they have little flimsy wings and whatever. Just stay outside. Right. You don't have a small yard. I have about an acre that I oftentimes do like a spring burn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is, would, would it be better to actually do it in the fall so then when the spring I heard, growth is coming? I usually mow really short and then burn in the fall. I do. That's how I get rid of all of the tall stuff. What's the best time to plant? The best time to plant, if you're going to just do a broad, a, you know, broadcast seeds, the best time to plant is any time after the first frost and before... Uh, before the end of February, you can plant any time in the late fall or winter. As long as it has about about a few weeks of cold weather, you know, of rain and stuff. The early, I think, just go ahead and plant in the late fall, and you're safe because you can you can usually be assured that we'll get at least a few cold snaps that will cold stratify those seeds for you. I would like to make a comment about milkweed. Uh, for those people who are really enthusiastic, I raise monarchs, and I've worked with a lot of milkweed. It is toxic. So if you're so enthusiastic going out looking for eggs, be sure that you wear gloves. Because I had a very bad experience. I rubbed my eyes. I was so excited. <laughs> and I rubbed my eyes, and it can be extremely painful. Yeah, and also children careful. and pets. I have my milkweed gated off. Yeah, and most animals won't eat it. It's right. it's a very common pasture plant, and you'll notice that it's always like the only thing standing because the cows avoid it. But yeah, be be careful and wash your hands. If you're not wearing gloves, wash that milky sap. You don't want to you know ingest that. Um, but and and yeah, like you said, it's it is toxic. Monarch butterflies are toxic, and um, and that's how they that's one of their defenses. I ordered milk seed seeds a couple of years ago, but I had so many of them. I passed them out, but I have places to plant about kept them. I, I've got them up in a cool, dry place. How long did she make them? The seeds, how long did they last? Do you think they might still that viable after a cap in a cool, dry place? Do you stratify them? They have been in the refrigerator? No, they've been up my closet. I don't know. Oh, I don't, I don't know. Okay. They should be okay. You can just try them. It doesn't hurt to try. Are all of these oh, no, those are, those are not. Those are not all milkweeds. Um, those are just pictures of just some things that I recommend planting at different times of the year. The ones that are on the right hand side of the handout, those are the milk, those are milkweeds on the right hand side, that list. Those are the milkweeds that I've had, oh, I'm sorry, yes, on the left. Those are the milkweeds that I've had the best luck so far in growing in my own yard. I'm going to make a quick comment just so that MDOT has adopted a new policy for mowing the roadside. And they get a lot of negative phone calls about the lack of mowing that's taking place on the roadside. It's not entire statewide. It accepts urban areas from the new mowing schedule to help benefit pollinators and monarchs. So I really recommend to everybody in this room, sounds like they're pretty pro-pollinators and modify mowing regimes, really do make that phone call and say what a good job they're doing because they hear a lot of just They do, this. they do. People don't like those weeds. And and if you can call and encourage them to keep up the good work or they're beautiful or you saw this and you haven't seen it in years, um, that really does help. Write a letter, make a phone call, um, contact your commissioner, and, and it really does go a long way. They need that positive feedback. This is the flip side of spraying things on the roadside. We've got cocon grass all in, up and down, which is really an invasive species. Mm -hmm. It is an invasive species. And, and it's, 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 you've got to spray it to get rid of it. And, yeah. and the mowers that you were talking about have distributed it all up and down the highway. They have. So selective spraying is sometimes necessary to control the spread of invasive plants. Um, you know, it's our it's our fault that they're that it's here, and you know, it's our problem to get rid of. Uh, can you come back to the uh, the yeah. tropical and all over the place? Can you clarify that? Is that a sure, bad thing? sure. Uh, well, I'm not going to say it's a bad. It's not a bad plant. It's not a bad species. It's the species that monarchs use while they're in Mexico. 
Um, it is adapted for tropical climates. It's not native to Mississippi, but it's sold widely in garden shops and in big box stores. And there has been monarchs that are raised on tropical milkweed. They love it. Don't get me wrong. That's what they, that's what they use when they're in Mexico. Um, but because of the way that it's cultivated in mass and grown in mass, um, there has been a higher incidence of disease in monarchs that are raised on tropical milkweed than in monarchs that are raised on native milkweed. So I try to avoid it, or I do avoid it, and I try to get other people to avoid it as well. We have 18 species to choose from. We can, we can certainly choose, choose some native ones. Um, that's what monarchs depend on when they're here, and, uh, and they're, if you can source it from a wild population, that's even better. Um, there's Asclepius viridis, that green antelope horn milkweed. I'm going to go back to that so in case anybody wants to kind of take, oh, it's what I'm holding right there. Um, that, there's plenty, plenty, plenty of that species of milkweed growing on every roadside out in pastures and fields. Get permission from somebody who has cows. They would probably love for you to come and cut some of that milkweed to feed your caterpillars because the cows won't eat it, they don't want to make hay out of it, um, and so, and the monarchs love it. It's very, and it's a beautiful plant. Dig it up, it has a tuber. So if you're digging it up, dig down to the tuber. If you're, not grow, if you're wanting to transplant milkweed, most of the species have a tuber, so you need to get the tuber as well. Some of them, the tuberosa, the butterfly weed, the orange one that's native, that has a very, very deep, Tuber, and you have to dig and dig and dig. I just plant it from seed. Mm -hmm. And those are perennials, they'll come back. They are, they are perennials. They will be back and back and back. Well, I was actually going to ask that. So, how perennial are they? Because I, I planted some of those last year and they did great. Then, we, when we had these two freezes back in January, not only did they die, but none, they didn't reseed or anything. I mean, that happened with your native milkweed that you were The tuberosa. The tuberosa? Yeah. That's interesting. You know, they may still be alive. I would keep looking for them maybe next year. Um, if they had a, have a lot of stress or if they're just starting to grow, a lot of times they'll put all of that root development, that's kind of their priority, and then the, the growth, the above ground growth will happen later. So don't give up on them. They could have died, but um, they... I mean, I mean, I've planted other stuff in, that, in those areas. There's, no, there's nothing there. I mean, they came, the stems just broke off from the ground. Yeah, well, and that happens. Their stems can break off and they can still be alive underground. So just look for brand new growth. They start over brand new all year. They die down in the wintertime and are just woody kind of like stems, brown stems, and then they'll come back fresh the following year. It's, it's the, probably the easiest for you to find. They grow, they grow widely. They're easy to grow. You can grow them in full sun or partial sun. Um, and, well, if they, if you don't get their seed pods off, then they can spread. But I see that as a good thing because then I can dig up new plants and put them where I want them to go. They, they they like that and that's that's a good that's a good source of energy for them absolutely and a lot of birds like fruits as well so that's good wow. historically they did historically monarch butterflies I've heard Bill Stark say that when he first moved to Clinton in the 70s that the field that was near his house in Clinton, where there were just, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of monarch butterflies. And, and that field had lots of milkweed. It's now a ballpark. But, um, and so, yes, historically they could be found in large numbers like that. Now there, there are overwintering sites in Florida for the Easter, extreme eastern monarch population. So that could have been 
depending on what time of year it is, it could have, they could have been congregating there for overwintering. Any other questions? I know that there is a, some sort of program out right now where they're uh, trying to get farmers and different people, because I'm from the Delta, mm -hmm. uh, to plant areas in wooded areas, like the species of butterfly grasses. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I actually am participating in a program similar to that this year. Um, I applied through the NRCS, the, you know, part of the USDA, they have a monarch program and they also have a pollinator program. And they will fund you if, you, if you get selected, and it depends on how much money that they have, they will fund you and, per, and they fund you to buy seeds and plant the seeds of, of native, na native species of grasses and wildflowers. And I'm doing that this year with an acre and a half, and so I'm really excited. I've gotten my seed in and I'm excited to plant this fall. That's great. That's great, because those seeds can be expensive for large areas. Any other questions? Like I said, email me. I've, I always love talking about pollinators.